uh, Shadow Gliders a Plena Outburst to clear the way, which might be very important later. Yes. Because Planar Outburst doesn't really ask questions about how big you are. It just says, mm, are you not a land? Okay, then you're dead. Pretty slow start from either one here. Yeah, for a format that's meant to go long and get you to very big things. Oh, that's a good start. Ooh. Left Spring Druid here under the shiny sun. Yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll take care of that for you in just a moment. Cloud Manta uh, for Zybold is his first play. 3-2 Flyer. Vanilla Flyer, as we say. No other b abilities. Just three power in the air. That's very good in this format. Three power evasion paired with some nice defense. That goes a long way. We see a Catacomb Sifter here inside the center. That's actually going to be played, making a 1-1 in the process. I'm taking my own signs, thank you. Attacking with the Livestream Druid, interestingly, Saito says my mana is less important than your flyer, and that's probably true. Attack with a Cloud Manta for three, and a follow-up Ghostly Sentinel. Oh, that's a huge beating. It certainly is. Saito at 17, but currently facing six power flies on the other side of the table. We see a Velocut Invoker here in Saito Sand. That's going to be relevant once he hits eight mana. That can probably deal with almost everything in the deck of Cybolt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see many creatures that survive that. But for now, it's the classic blue-white flyers archetype that holds sway. And you think flyers should be less aggressive, and that's actually six power in flying. Right, Valakut Invoker are down for Saito. In we come for six. Saito to 11. Saito can do anything. Wow. Here comes another ghostly sentinel. Incidentally, I do apologize for the announcements in the background. Uh, we're in what is now becoming a very echoey uh, hall. Um, and uh, we're still at rock concert levels on the uh, stadium announcements, uh, it's fair to say. So uh, apologies if you're not able to take advantage of these last few firing drafts of the day here at Grand Prix Lyon. This is, is that an aspect? Saito untaps, looking at an absolute flying avalanche on the other side of the table. If he manages to kill a flyer every turn with the invoker, that actually makes him survive by two life points. Okay, so he goes kill, take six. Kill, uh, kill, kill take five. Uh, no, kill, take six, kill, take three. Take yeah, God. Uh, that's close, huh? <laughs> I think he has also a bone that's splinter in oh, the sense. This is always assuming that Cyborg, you know, takes the rest of the game off. Right. Let's uh, let's not bother. Sometimes you have to uh, hope that your opponent doesn't do anything anymore. Sure. But we see there's another ghostly sentinel, number three in the hand. How many how many of those do you play? Apparently three. Th At three least. three is the correct number, is it? I think so. With the fourth one. Uh, I have to see if there's nothing else in my deck I want to play, then the fourth one is fine. But I think three is a good amount to have. Well, he's drawn them all. Trips Sentinel. Usually the Sentinel that we expect to see in multiples <laughs> is Kozilek Sentinel, <laughs> the two drop in red. Don't often see um, the ghostly version hunting in packs. So he sacrificed the Eldrazi Scion for a scry and the mana to shoot one of the sentinels. And I think then the live stream druid will sacrifice itself for the bone splinters. Ooh. Ah, it's the catacomb sifter, okay. And you know why he kept the live stream druid? Because he has a huge Eldrazi in his hand. This is not a surprise, because Saito um, kind of monopolized the, the end. What, not what we called the late game, but as we referred to earlier in the day, the late, late, late game. <laughs> right. So now Zybold's uh, board not looking nearly as impressive. He has to turn 
the Cloud Manta sideways. Yeah, and now actually the Velocity Invoker can deal with the whole board in a decent amount of time. Mm -hmm. Here's Ghostly Sentinel, number three, but on the board, number one. Interestingly, Zybolt only has one way to deal with it except for the Planar Outburst, and that's a Stasis Snare or a Gideon's Reproach when the Invoker is actually attacking. He can put it back with Royal Spout, but that won't deal with it for long. He can bounce it with Clutch of Currents, also not preventing it. It could buy some time. That could actually have. Saito has only eight life. And there's still something to be played from Cyborg side, so it won't be just this board. I think Cyber is thinking about attacking here. Maybe they're sorting something out. Okay, now he passes the turn. Cybold uh, says, let's have another go. Down to five. Incubator drone. Uh, it's two creatures, but it is, well, and now it's one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, incubator drone, generally two creatures or four creatures, but on this weird occasion, three. That's a blight herder, I think. Saito does indeed have a blight herder and a desolation twin. And a rune processor that doesn't make the cut because, you know, why would you when you have something as big as a desolation to him? The question is, can he actually exile something for the brighter? It's fine. It's a 5 mana 4-5. Usually you don't need to have to uh, process something. Yeah, and, and the big bonus from it isn't currently that, that significant. Um, because it does outclass what's on the, the ground side of Zybold right now. He is able to play the Desolation Twins. That means he would have three creatures to block with. The Manta drops him to two. So he could also just use the Invoker here and kill the Manta, but then he gets attacked by the two drones, which drops him also to three. I think I would... Sh uh I think I would play the Desolation Twins. No, I think Here I would have Here we are. It's twin time. Ooh. Here in the semi-finals. Not one, but two. That's huge. Thank you. That's huge, huge. One for each. So Cybold has 20-20 vision right now. Looking across the table. That's a clutch of currents. Bouncing but the token. Goodbye token. Make my land real. And that is actually it. In I come. Wow. Thank you very much for playing. Oh, you made the desolation twin, but there's no... Oh, no congratulations for Tomohara Saito. He got all the way to 10 mana put 20 power onto the battlefield and then swept up his permanence <laughs> and got ready for game number two. I love magic. Yeah, usually it goes like, oh, at least to get to ca cast my 10 drop and then I die. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to stay right here to see whether the Desolation Twin can come down again and actually mean something this time. Uh, but I can tell you uh, that in the other semi-final between Damien Bouillot and Vincent Lemoyne, it is the Belgian Vincent Lemoyne who leads by one to zero. Uh, we would have popped across there to just to get a little look in for you, uh, but they too are shuffling for their game too, and we want to not miss a thing in this matchup between the Grand Prix Barcelona champion, Christian Seibold, uh, one third of the all-German squad, along with the brothers Grafensteiner, uh, Danny and Tobias, 
I got to get a look at the deck of Damien, and he has a really good blue-black uh, ingest devoid deck. Okay. Uh, he has the Wasteland Strangler, which is an awesome card to remove stars. Right. He has good removal in form in Demon's Grass. He has good ingest cards, Benthic Intertrader, Merc Strider. It was a really good... He has a Smothering Abomination. A oh, big I love that flyer, card. drawing cards. Mm -hmm. So he made a really quick progress, uh, process out of his quarterfinals opponent. Right. But here, in the semis, he is 1-0 down to Lemoyne. Now, can Saito... He doesn't even have to go the distance to Desolation Twin because in addition to the Blight Herder um, and uh, he, he has Omnath, Locus of Rage, which we saw in game one of the quarterfinals uh, to great effect. These two met in the Swiss uh, in the penultimate round, uh, the first round of the draft this afternoon, uh, round 13. Seibold at that point uh, won. Uh, to take him to 12 and 1, drop Saito to 11 and 2, and be on the verge of elimination. Uh, and when they were finished, Seibold uh, did say, I really hope you make it into the top eight because you are a great player, a truly great player. I thought that was A, very nice uh, from a winner to someone who they just, just vanquished, but it was quite clearly sincere. You know, and Seibold's someone, like many of us in the game, who, uh, if you like, grew up within the world of professional magic at a time sort of 2005 to 2009 when Japan were at the absolute peak of their powers and it was almost a given that there would be a player of the year from Japan every year one of which of course was Tomohiro Saito he is uh, the player of the year I've talked to mm -hmm. Saibo a little bit and you see he has not only respect for the game but also for the player and that's a huge uh, like a huge thing to have you see that he really means it he wants to have good games he wants to treat players with respect and mm -hmm. have a nice atmosphere ideally followed by a 2-0 victory <laughs> yes <laughs> of course you want to win quite so let's get to it here's game number two Saito uh, again matched up uh, Forest against Plains Mountain on turn two we're not expecting a lot of early game and once again we're going to get to turn three with an empty board outside those four uh, lovely basics and for two mana seek the wilds uh, says Saito so let's see uh, what we've got up there. Saibo decides to take a little look, while Saito decides to take a little look. <laughs> Sigta White is actually a nice card in those decks because it can fetch for a land if you really need it to play your curve, or mm -hmm. it can fetch for a big creature or a small creature even. So I like the flexibility here. And I think he decides to take a Pilgrim's Eye because that also represents a land. <laughs> ah, I'm not sure. Keeps checking. Yes. There we go. There we go. Seeing so Kozilek's channel is going away. A boiling earth. Mm -hmm. And something drowsy like uh, That looked to me like the processor. That's true. Ruin processor, I think. We have talked about the drafts and the uh, Brute Hunter Worm and that people weren't really uh, convinced that this card is actually good enough beyond average to be in a deck. But Saito, I think, plays two of them, right? Yes, two Brute Hunter Worm. Mm. That's a surprise. Well, the th I, I guess the thing is, he does not want to get beaten in the mid-game because he knows he has the late game locked up. And the one thing that does, you know, it can, it can <coughs> trade for an awful lot of things um, you know, that would come in in the two and three power range. He's just like, no, I will, I will trade you off. And he didn't have a lot of cheaper options to do the same task. Cybold yeah. comes in with his Shadow Glider, adds Core Castigator to the board. And that's a two drop that actually kills the Brute Hunter Worm. Right. But Saito doesn't mind that. Nor the, in some matches, that's a really terrible trade because you're like, well, I invested a whole four mana in mine. You've just got a little two drop. But Saito is, is a, all about time. Yeah. Right? This, this is a, I won't say it's a tempo deck because that, that is clearly <laughs> misleading. But it is a deck that is about time. Um, and uh, Brood Hunter Worm says, yeah, I got here first. You will have to come through me. You'll have to spend time, rebuild your board again. Four mana, four power is very good to block up, which means like kill bigger creatures mm -hmm. in blocking. Yep. And as you said, attacking, not really necessary here. He has, I think, two Eyeless Watcher, but no Swarm for the Bone Splinters. Okay. 
So let's see what he makes out of this. I think it's also a Tajuro Beastmaster in his hand. Okay. 5-5, five, five, plus 1, plus 1. It seems like to be a different card. Okay. Uh, so here's Eyeless Watcher. Let's bring along two things that can't block Core Castigators, but never mind, A, I've got a 1-1 one, one that can. A, a significant reason why Eyeless Watcher is better than Call the Scions. Another two from the Shadow Glider. Uh, this taking on a similar pattern to Game 1, which featured Cybold assembling an Air Force, but this time uh, it's Incubated Drone and the Ghostly Sentinels, which was so much in evidence in Game 1, not there yet. So it's just two at a time, packing away with the Shadow Glider. And here you see again and again how important evasion is. The board is completely sold out. Nobody will probably attack in the next two turns, but the Shadow Glider keeps dealing two damage, and that's the key. If you can find the invasion route to damage. Mm -hmm. So here's Pilgrim's Eye. I'll go and fetch up a land. In a move that surprises nobody, it's a swamp. Yeah. Question is if you want to actually kill the Shadow Glider or he thinks he has enough time to cast the Invoker and kill it through in the, the, in the long game. Yeah. The question is, Im it's got to be fairly hard for Saito to work out where he is in the game at 16 life, in the sense that at the moment there's this clock of 14, 12, 10. But that could very easily be 14, 9, 4, with just one ghostly sentinel. And that's a very different clock. We see Saibolt here sideboarding the score from existence. So preparing for big Eldrazi to be played sure. and to be exiled. So seven. Oh, interesting. <laughs> well, preparing just to spend seven mana, one of which was a scion, just to get the Valka Invoker off the board, which would have been live this turn if necessary, thanks to two scion. Yeah, that's very important. Not being able to kill the whole bird basically for free. He needs to n spend no cards on killing everything. Mm -hmm. A very good... All for the here. low, low price of eight mana. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a low price if you get doesn't get punished. You don't get punished. Sure, sure. Still, nobody's really blinking in the attacking game on the ground. He could kill the core castigator with the bone spinders to attack with the brute hunter worm because he has a. Um, Giant Mantis to block the Shadow Glider. But he can also just save the Bone Swinders for bigger creatures, and I think that's just a better play. So Pilgrim's Eye, after what seems a long old time, uh, finally uh, deals some damage to Christian Cybold, and as expected, there's the Giant Mantis. Oh, I think I saw the planner out I this. think so too. But interestingly enough, he plays the Incubator Drone. So he thinks that he still gets an advantage out of playing a creature that stalls the board more. Sometimes he, it seems a bit awkward to play a creature when you have the Wrath in hand because mm -hmm. you want to save up the creatures in hand. But it is actually better to play some creatures to make your opponent react to that even more. That's probably a Gideon's reproach it you see here. Exactly what it is. And that's something that neither player is particularly upset by. No. If he attacks with a Shadow Glider, that's usually expectable. Back to Saito. Who, on the one hand, will be quite pleased that he's managed to, if not exactly stabilize, the game is well and truly in its mid to advanced stage. And he's still on 14. The clock is seven turns currently, but of course it's way more than that in reality. And he will feel, well, 
all these things that I'm not good against, the aggro decks that I was worried about when I was drafting and when I was building my deck and talking with Frank Carsten, he said, didn't like my deck if I face aggro. Well, this really is an aggro, and you said, Taroff, that in game one, it was surprisingly aggressive, the blue-white flyers deck. Well, this is much more, yeah, here's an incubator drone and a little scion that's not doing an awful lot. Here's a castigator that hasn't actually done anything since it turned up. Um, as Pilgrim's Eye comes back the other way. Putting Zybold to 18. Now Saito has to find, find one of the big payoffs cards. We know that one isn't enough because of the planar outburst. Right. But he just goes for the next Eyeless Watcher, which basically doesn't add anything to the board. Those tokens get eaten up by the incubator drones. Mm-hmm. Do just want to check there's no Swarm Surge in Saito's deck because we're starting to get to the point where that's a really big game. Uh, but he does not. I wouldn't expect him to play if I would be Cybold. There might be a Tajuro Warcaller. That would be very, very uh, bad. Oh my God. So there is a gain of thinking about killing all the creatures just because there's so many of them. What's really interesting is Saito has a Tajuro Warcaller uh, has a Tajuri Warcaller in his pool, but not in his main deck. So, any particular reason to bring it in? It doesn't seem likely. It seems more like a, a, a proper judgment call. No, this is not what I need. Maybe he decides to put it in because he's on the play and he thinks he can steal a game with some Eyeless Watchers. But on average, I don't think that's going to happen. Right. If he doesn't decide to include it in the main deck, it probably won't be cyborg. Right, so the most likely thing is that one of the, what would now look like a win condition, not available right now. You still save the Bone Splinter for something, and it gets to a point where he has to think about using it. Yeah. And that was the point. <laughs> Because now he actually doesn't have to be afraid of anything until the next flyer hits the board. Mm -hmm. And that could look like a draw-go scenario. <laughs> this is turning into a really good one because they're sort of... You wouldn't think either of them are precisely happy with how the game is. Yeah. There are... Saito knows that he doesn't have a Swarm Surge, so there isn't really a win there. But Cybold doesn't know he doesn't have a Swarm Surge or a Tajuru Warcaller. So he's scared of that. Saito knows that there are flyers on the other side somewhere in the deck. And he won't look forward to that. But Saito will be looking forward to some casting Omnath or Desolation Twin. Cybold knows he's sort of got the answer to that right now, but doesn't actually have the answer um, to what he's going to win with right now. So they're both kind of thinking everything's sort of all right. Yeah. And in a little while, things are going to be a lot better. One of them's almost certainly wrong. So that's a very weird attack, it seems like, because he just attacks into the Brute Hunter Worm, for example. But this definitely just signals a trick, most likely encircling fissure. I would be... I don't see him doing that with a Gideon's Reproach. I don't see him doing that with a Tandem Tactics. Maybe that could work. But surely you do see it with a, with a Planar Outburst. If you're on Saito's side, don't you go, oh, is this the suicide me in just in case I get some free damage through? Um, yeah, that could be. Although I, then your opponent has to be really afraid of the amount of creatures, and uh, I don't think that was actually much necessary. But it's, Boom. it's going to happen, and that resets the board with a 4-4 advantage to Cybold. Yeah, and the thing is, let, let's not forget that Saito is really low on cards here. It's not like Cybold's looking across the table and seeing five cards in hand and thinking, when he rebuilds, it's going to be brutal. That's true. The one thing that really speaks for this play is that if Saito would have had a 10-mana spell, he would have casted it already. Right. So here's Boiling Earth uh, with Awaken, which got rid of nothing but did mean... We're at parity again, but just with a much cleaner board. Thanks, boys. Yeah, that's a easier to overlook thing. 
they probably will be trading. I can see an interest, although the clutch of Corings now, that <laughs> makes a whole oh, difference. It really does. And suddenly, we are a turn away from Christian Seibold being in the final. That is the most brutal clutch we've seen this weekend. Do you remember this comment that I said, this could go on for turns? Oh, that's it! <laughs> Christian Seibold pulled the trigger on planar outburst and then got the job done. He is through to the final. Saito is bested and Christian Seibold will wait in the final for one of Vincent Lemoyer or Damien Brio. Which one? Let's find out because they are at 1-1 in their semi-final. So you've got a chance, especially for the Belgian fans. Uh, we know the huge magic Belgic community uh, wanting Vincent Lemoyne to do the business here against Damien Brio. But they are gearing up for their third game. Toral, while we wait for this third game to start, though, boy, we saw fireworks. Those, If you took snapshots at 30-second intervals yeah. of that board state as that game went on, the last three photos would be pretty head-swimming. That planet outburst was an amazing judgment call from Cyborg. I think a lot of people, including myself, would have waited, waited there for mm -hmm. maybe a better payoff. But he saw correctly that this is the window to attack. He even had the clutch of currents to know that if my if Saito plays another creature, I would just bounce it and attack for seven. And it was, amazingly enough, just a land that got awakened. So that was the perfect scenario. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I'm going to bounce it, but actually I'm killing it. Blue, white, flyers... Awaken, Tempo Bounce, waiting in the wings for one of these two. Vincent Lemoyne, top eight of Pro Tour Paris, 2011, the, the famous Core Blade Channel 5 will coming out party, won by Ben Stark eventually. I think he still plays a lot of GPs and he hasn't had a success in quite a while, so I really want him to do one. Yeah, he um, he went away from the game uh, for a while, g got very busy with, with real life. Um, round about the time that that, that group of Belgians that included uh, the likes of Fried Mulders and Jan Dwars, uh, both Viren brothers, Pascal and Peter, um, people like Moraine Leibert, of course, uh, with his four Pro Tour top eights. Um, he was uh, very much part of that group and, and Lemoyne and then Christophe Gregoire. You know, there was a real, uh, there was a huge movement with, with Belgian uh, magic. They were, they were really good. And then, you know, they gradually, you know what it's like, you go to GPs, but then one or two peel away, a driver stops going across Europe uh, and suddenly the, it's three or four of you and then it's like, oh, well, I'm getting married in the spring and suddenly it's just one or two and then uh, Vincent, uh, went away uh, from the game for a little while. But uh, he comes to quite a few European GPs now, um, but not in the same competitive way, which means that this is, um, you know, almost a, <laughs> a, a legacy performance. You know, this is coming out of muscle memory and, and coming out of... Uh, I, I'm pretty sure he's been sort of looking at some of the cards this weekend and going, yeah, I, oh, I, I hadn't quite realized that's what that did. I, I don't think he has a ton of reps under his belt. Um, in this format. But, but he's still a fantastic player. Oh, terrific. Absolutely. And you you can see a bit old school in him, I think. Like uh, like taking the time, uh, trying something new, thinking about cards in a different way. Mm -hmm. That's basically a sign of somebody with a lot of experience. But Damien Brio got all the way here to the semi-finals. And he quite fancies a crack at Christian Zybold too. So we'll see how that goes as Lemoyne will take, and this means scry. Hopefully everyone's got the memo about scrying now, um, as we kick off with Island from Puyo, opposite Forest, and a turn one play. It's Blisterpod from Vincent Lemoyne. Blisterpod, a very interesting card. It doesn't seem like it does much, but it blocks very well in the beginning of the game, and the one mana makes a difference. Usually from four to five or from five to six, you can play this turn, this uh, spell one turn earlier. On the draw makes a huge, huge effect. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see Snapping Knowledge, which is a real spell. Um, and at the end of turn, we're going to see Anticipate, which sort of isn't, um, but does, does, you know, help. Not saying it's a bad card, uh, but Snapping Knowledge certainly a very real presence on the board in the way that Anticipate is not. 
Uh, mm. Puyo looking to um, add his second color, which is a, a swamp, as Taraf mentioned. It's a nice blue-black uh, deck we've got here. You know what I just saw going to the bottom? Mm -hmm. Up Nixilis. Really? That's where that ended up? Yeah, he rightfully took the swamp to uh, cast his spells from his hand, but that's a bit of a sad moment. Right. Culling drone comes down uh, for Buio. But for Lemoyne, thanks to Landfall, uh, that's a 3-3 against a 2-2. Not a fair fight, so the 3-3 is just swung on by and puts Buio to 16. Snapping Nalit, definitely one of the pillars of the green colors. Mm -hmm. Like, basically every green deck wants to have much, as much Snapping Nalit as they can. Call the Scions. Adds to Lemoyne's board. has two Call the Scions and three to Jeru Stalwart. We saw that draft actually after the draft of Saito and it was a very difficult draft. There were some uh, key decisions that uh, were very interesting to follow. Mm -hmm. He has a lot of those tapped lands, Looming Spire. Yeah, I'm just looking at this and I, I was looking at his basic land. He's got nine basic land in his deck. Yeah, that is true. Seven forests and I was thinking He's just not listed one entire color. One island, one mountain. So like, where are the other nine lands? And it's Canopy Vista, Evolving Wilds, Fertile Thicket, Looming Spires, Lumbering Falls, Mortuary Mire, two Sandstone Bridge, one Skyline Cascade. Captain non-basic. <laughs> and considering that those pair up with the Snapping Nardy to a 4-4, four four, that's pretty good. You don't need much hits from 4-4 four four to kill somebody. Yep. So now we have a pair of culling drones. But those are really better on offense than defense. And um, Coral Helm Guide, well, that's not actually that great on either. That's more on utility duty. Yeah, usually pairs up with good with bigger creatures. Mm -hmm. But culling drones, not really what you want to make unblockable. So here's Looming Spires. So that's landfall, landfall, effectively, yeah. uh, for the Snapping Gnarled. I think we see a complete disregard here before the Snapping Gnarled turns a 4-4. Right. Let's make that go away. Turn sideways, uh, if you like, at Le Mans gra graveyard to indicate the exile because that's very definitely relevant uh, in terms of uh, Buyo's ability to process later in the game. Interesting, he attacks with the Invoker here, not waiting to have eight mana. He just trades with what seems to be an irrelevant calling drone. Here's another Call the Scions. That's his second. Maybe he's trying to get rid of the two toughness creatures to attack with the one power creatures, because he has quite a few of those. Yeah, he does not have any Tajiri war callers. Yeah, that was one of the things commenting on the draft that he has a lot of stuff that makes uh, small tokens, like call the science, but he doesn't really have a way to push them through. Not a lot of payoff. Yeah. So Maya's Malice discarding the Tajiri stalwart and I think a touch of the void. Yes, yeah. Good spot. And we know that there's not much coming now from the master. There's a Sylvester party going on here. That there's certainly some balloons being popped. <laughs> Sylvan Scrying uh, from Lamar. Who does have some very powerful converge effects. Yeah, and a big arsenal of non basic lands that he can search. Right. None of them really appealing here. He'd probably be taking a Mercury Maya to get back a creature. Ah, he has a Lumbering Falls also. Yeah. That's a neat land. So who's ahead here? I know. I, pr I, I hope that's a tough question. Uh, I, I think that uh, Damien is quite ahead here. Okay. Because he has two cards which are probably not lands, so he will be right. able to maybe play a... 3-3, three, 4-4, three, four, four, 
and take course of the game pretty easily. We couldn't quite get a glimpse what he has. He has a Wasteland Strangler that I can see. Mm -hmm. He's just drawn a Swamp. Unfortunately, no cards ingested, but maybe he can even use one activation of the Coral Helm Guide to get an ingest. Yeah, no, he's just... Ah, right, he yes, has the th card. there is the one. Not that this... I mean, that is as weak and feeble as a, <laughs> as a kill goes. <laughs> it's like, hooray, I do get to mm, kill a Sion. No. Back we go to Lemoir. I'm wondering maybe you want to attack with a Culling Drone because getting rid of two one ones, or at least the Blister Pot and then the Drazi Sion seems like a good effect. Mm -hmm. Lemoir making Lumbering Falls and then giving it plus one, plus one and Vigilance with Sandstone Bridge. Probably not the spot here to block. If he wants to activate it again next round, it will be a three toughness attacker and that can be just blocked off by the Wasteland Strangler. Mm -hmm. Is there added value to Buyo if you like taking the turn off to utilize Coral Helm Guide in terms of actually exiling things? Uh, is that something that he'll be factoring in uh, that it's actually worth having some... Because right now there is, there is nothing exiled. Yeah, if he doesn't have to do anything, that's a good consideration. He has two Merkstrider in his deck which need a card exiled. Mm -hmm. He has an Oracle of Dust where you always want to have some fodder to loot. Yep. And the Waste and Stranger here already drew. So I think that's about it for the ingesting cards, uh, for the processing cards. Right, which tends to suggest that if he's going to spend five on the Coral Helm Guide, he really wants to be doing it because he's wanting to threaten Lemoyne's life total, which currently, 20, quite a way off. He has a m he drew a Mochimari, I thought, I think, and that could actually lead to a, an attack with the Wasteland Strangler and making the Culling Drone unblockable to get an ingest, making the Strangler die and putting it back on top. You're quite good at this, aren't you? <laughs> The first priority of Damien should be... Oh, he has a lot of life. 12E. I think that's about like 50 or something. Uh, I'm not going to get into math land <laughs> on that. Let's, let's just have him back on 12. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we see happening here. And his first priority should be now to get rid of the little tokens on the board. Mm -hmm. Well, he's going to sort of get rid of two, but of course one comes back, or a new one, off the blister pod. There's Mortary Mire. I'll have a Strangler. Now the road is clear for this turn, so the Lumbering Falls can attack if they want to. But that costs four mana. But the one doesn't have a lot else going on, so he's going to rumble with the team. And that's actually he six damage. He's ahead on life, and he's just taken half of Buio's life away. Massive card in the deck right now for Lemoyne. Obviously, he's out of cards. But you can see this being an Exert Influence game. That is true. Because Exert Influence takes essentially anything. Not quite anything, um, but that's certainly the way things are, are looking. And Lemoyne will feel that if Damien just pushes the button on, I think I'm on offense now, Xerd influence could be enormous for the Belgian. He also has, has another copy, copy of Touch of the World. Mm -hmm. So if Damien actually falls to three, which we might see happen thank f uh, thanks to the Lumbering Falls, mm -hmm. that could be a very potent draw. Oh, you know what he's playing? He's playing the Prism Array. Oh, tap. Yeah. Tap your things down. That would actually tap everything. He doesn't even need the Wuburg Scry. Right. He just plays it. Yes. Such a beautiful card. Are you talking about the art, the design, the playing J of? Just everything. You Really? You're a fan? I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. I like that it's not that good so it it really is not clear if it's playable or not okay do you remember search the city from return to ravnica yes that, that is kind of the same card. yeah okay 
<laughs> really not playable at all in like 99% of the cases, but sometimes it makes a difference. Okay, Demon's Grass says your giant mant is actually pretty good. Let's let's make it dead. And a little two for one being offered up here. Which Lemoine's gonna say yes to. He does he does not want to have things exiled. Yeah, also he knows that his tokens are not doing much. Right, sure. We have the advantage of knowing that nothing really can happen if the card gets ingested. Like a Merc Strider is Yes, it's fine, and an Orc of Dust is also okay, but there's no Ruin Possessor that gives uh, Spike Life. Sure. Yeah, because that would, that would be terrible for, for Lemoyne right now, because yeah. 11 and 6 are very, very different. 6, he can, even though he's top decking every turn, he can see a way that this could happen. Um, but at the point at which, yeah, I mean, 11's a long way off, so you can see him being scared of that. That's a tight drifter. And I think he drew the Smothering Abomination. Well, that'll change the dynamic of the game. That will be a huge play. If, yes. he to <laughs> if he chooses to put the 4-3 flyer with the uh, card-drawing engine attached at a cost. So, in I come. Uh, Luan decides, uh, actually, I don't fancy trading uh, there. Tide Drifter. Here we go. Zero, five. Everything gets plus O plus one. I'm going to make room for this Smothering Abomination. And now we're all in top deck mode pretty much. Uh, Lemoyne had one card that he kept. So he's got two cards. brio has got none. 15 to six. Remember that Christian Zybold is waiting in the wings. And now things are going to speed up because Smothering Abomination really does carve through decks and carve through matches one way or another. So let's see what it does here. Yeah, he will attack the Korahem guy because it doesn't really attack well against the Lumbering Falls. And it's nice to have the O5 blocker around in the form of Tide Drifters. And if he draws like another spell now, this is getting pretty quickly. Also, that Tide Drifter is a really big deal. Uh, because he, he can just make sure that Wasteland Strangler doesn't get blocked and traded for at any point currently. Mm. Oh, hello. Okay, they would, sure, they were just two lands, but that is huge. And we said things were going to move swiftly. They really are here because now we're going to see Wasteland Strangler. And, yep, three, seven, ten. Lever zero, five back. Lumbering Falls pretty much is obliged to exist. Yeah, very important not blocking the island here because it is actually a 3-4 thanks to the Tide Drifter. Right. So they trade. He still takes 7 damage yep. and falls down to 8. Strangler goes away. Which isn't lethal next turn. But I can't imagine that, there's, uh, that it's going to be a hard game for Damien to win. So upkeep, they he keeps asking about upkeep because, of course, you can bounce in response. But Tide Drifter goes away, and that's two cards a turn. That's Dominator Ooh. Drone. That actually seals and the deal. And that, unless Vincent Lemoyne has something quite serious in hand, an attack plus a Dominator Drone is going to be it. Lemoyne is down to his last chance. Dominator Drone, that is game set and match to Damian Boyo. Congratulations to him. And a little shake of the head from Vincent Lemoyne. He did everything he could. But in the end, it is Damian Boyo who advances to the final. Great job uh, by him. Uh, so congratulations to Damian Boyo uh, who advances to the final. And uh, welcome back uh, to the desk here, Rich and Taroff here with you, uh, we're walking you through the semi-finals, and by my reckoning then, Damian Buio will face Christian Seibold in the final of GP Leon. Two very good players, one with a, a very good reputation around Europe, Buio, the unknown quantity. Um, I think 
one of the nice things about Cybold, especially for someone like Buio, is that Cybold is not uh, one of those very intimidating presences. He's quite. A, he's a very calm player, very methodical. D not not a big smiler. He's not chatty at the table, but nor is he off-putting uh, in any way. And I think that'll help Buio because your first final, it's it's always a bit a big moment and. You know, it's a, it's a very unusual atmosphere. As we look around the room, you know, the GP is being disintegrated around us, as it always is at this time on a Sunday night. And suddenly there's just two of you in this really quiet space with a lot of people you don't know hanging over the rail going, who, who are you? Are you any good? Let's find out. And a lot of people, like, sh uh, you know, shrivel. I don't mean, you know, not making a joke there. That they, they shrivel in the face of that. But I think... Cybold is, is a good opponent for Buyo to have here in the final.